class will may be too late. Now we have a very important topic to tackle. We come into the very heart of the, the problem. St. Francis of Assisi, you want to know more about him, don't you? And uh, his love for Our Lady, his love for Our Lady that brought him to see Our Lady in light of the Trinitarian mystery in relationship with the Holy Trinity. And uh, <clears throat> one, of the top, one of the titles he gave to Our Lady is Spouse of the Holy Spirit. But we want to know more about this title, which is not a simple title. It is a life. It is a theology behind that expression that Fra Francisco Maria Hoyos is going now to elucidate for us. We welcome a very good, famous speaker, Fra Francisco Maria Hoyos. <laughs> We have to thank him for organizing all the practical aspects and uh, for bringing things, putting things together. And uh, he's also now going to speak about Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit in St. Francis of Assisi. For us, Marian Franciscans, this is central, and uh, we are very happy to hear your talk, Fra Francisco. Over to you. Thank you very much, Father Serafino. Uh, not sure about famous, but I can certainly give a little contribution to, um, uh, to this topic of Our Lady Spouse of the Holy Spirit. Our Seraphic Father St. Francis was full of an overflowing love for the Blessed Virgin Mary because she made the world our brother, and through her, as the blessed Thomas of Silano tells us, he had conceived in humility the evangelical truth and given birth to the Franciscan order. In honor, not only he fasted, but composed many, many praises, so many that as the seraphic doctor St. Bonaventure tells us, it would have been impossible to record them all However, a couple of these prayers have arrived to us, one of which is to be found in the Office of the Passion, composed by him, by St. Francis, and which is to be repeated in the form of an antiphon 14 times throughout the liturgical hours. So the prayer goes, Holy Virgin Mary, among the women born into the world, there is no one like you, daughter and servant of the Most High and Supreme King, and of, the Ho and of the Father in Heaven, Mother of our Most Holy Lord Jesus Christ, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us with St. Michael the Archangel, all the powers of Heaven, and all the Saints at the side of your Most Holy Beloved Son, our Lord and Teacher. As I'm sure you would appreciate, this prayer presents Mary in the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, as the daughter of the Father and of the Son, and as one thing, una res, with the Holy Spirit in virtue of a mystical spousal. To understand this relation between Mary and the Holy Spirit, we must first consider the relation between the persons in the Trinity and the divine nature. So I do warn you, this is going to be a, a very difficult part now because we're going to enter into the mystery of the Holy Trinity as Revelation has uh, taught us and as the sacred theology has um, explained. It is well known the discussion amongst the early fathers of the church on the way in which the notion of person can be applied to God. And thanks to the theological development of the scholastics, we've been able to break through the equivocation and hereby strike a balance between, um, in virtue of 
of the, of the analogical principle by which everything that we see as perfect in nature must be attributed to God in a more excellent manner. So everything that we see as perfect, as good in nature must be attributed to God in a more excellent manner. And so that underlying perfection which we call individual subsistence of rational nature, because that's the definition of person, we rightly apply to God in such a way that underlying this same divine nature, there are three individual subsistence. In creation, the notion of person implies relation of distinction between an individual and its nature, between Fra Francisco and human nature, as it were. But in God, there is no distinction between each person and the divine nature. God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. There is only the substantial relation between the person, and thus there is a substantial distinction of origin. The Father generates the Son, and the Father and the Son generate the Holy Spirit. So we see here that there are two types of generation in God upon which the substantial relation is founded. So there is an intellectual generation, and this we call the word, and there is an, a generation by the will, which we simply call inspiration of love. And truly it is, as Boesius stated, that it is relation that multiplies God, not in the essence, of course, for as we know there is only one God, but in the persons. And this, in as much as the Father is the originating principle of the Son by way of, of this same intellectual procession. And the Father and the Son are the originating principle of the Holy Ghost by way of the will. But obviously, let us be careful not to be misled to think for a moment that this relation of origin in God implies some sort of hierarchical dignity. For as we know, there is equality in the dignity of the three persons, because dignity in each of the three persons lays in the divine nature, which is one and the very same. Now, after considering the relations in the Trinity, let us take a closer look at the person of the Holy Ghost. The name Holy Ghost has been accommodated to the third person of the Trinity by the use of scriptural speech. And as the great doctors of the church tell us, it is indeed most fitting that this name, which denotes two qualities common to the Father and the Son, namely holiness and spirituality, be properly attributed to him who proceeds from both the Father and the Son. This name is also fittingly appropriated to the third person because in our physics, in our um, sciences as it were, the name spirit seems to signify impulse or motion. And indeed, it is the property of love to move and to impel the will of the lover towards the object loved. And as we've seen, the Holy Ghost is a procession of the will. And the act of the will, of course, is to love. Further, as angelic doctor tells, tells us, holiness, which is attributed to whatever is ordered to God, is fittingly appropriated to the third person, which, again, proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
as an act of love of the same divine nature. And I really, really want you to keep this concept of holiness as order to God in mind because it would be essential to understand the relation between Mary and the Holy Spirit. Love in God can be considered essentially and notionally. If, I consider, if, we, consider, if we consider love essentially, we say that God loves himself and the creatures that can love him in a hierarchical order, of course. So the Father loves, the Son loves, the Holy Spirit loves. But when we consider love in the notional sense, we signify inspiration of love that proceeds from the will. And therefore, in this way, we appropriate the name love to the Holy Spirit, as we appropriate the name word to the Son, who proceeds from the Father as an intellectual conception. Another quality or attribute closely related to the personality of the Holy Ghost is gift. For it is proper of love to be gratuitous and to have aptitude for being possessed by the beloved. Now, a divine person can be said to belong to another either by origin, like the son belongs to the father, or as possessed by another. And in this last sense, it cannot belong to another divine person because, as we said, in God there is only one will. So it is evident that the Holy Spirit can only be possessed by, by a created rational being according to the promise of our Lord to his disciples before ascending to heaven. The Holy Spirit, as the gift from the Father and the Son, is manifested visibly in the sanctification of those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Moreover, with the mission of the Holy Spirit, there is established a unique relation between the lover and the object loved, between God and rational creatures. God loves himself, as we've seen, for he has willed to share his beatitude with creatures capable of partaking of it in a created manner. He has also willed that this sharing of his perfection should happen in a cosmos, in a universe, as it were, or order of things, in such a way as to have different degrees of participation. This love of God for rational creatures is what we call grace. Grace is a created quality by which we are made acceptable to God and therefore worthy of eternal life. And as we just mentioned, grace is caused in rational creatures by the love of God. So properly speaking, Grace puts something in God, and that is the will to love a certain creature and to make that same creature capable of eternal life. But he also puts something in man, that is the gift by which it is made lovable in the eyes of God and capable of, of a supernatural end. Therefore, we must say that grace indicates both the gift and the goodwill of the giver. While on the part of the person loved, it implies not only the gift itself by which he is made worthy of eternal life, but also a movement of the will to love and to tend towards the supernatural end. This movement of the heart of the person loved is necessary because otherwise 
we could have a situation whereby someone um, is loved by God, is given grace, and yet he's basically in a state of mortal sin, which is be, it would be an absurdity. So in this way, we see that grace relates to the affection as a form. So it relates to the heart, to the will, as a form that informs. As Augustine says, to move the will is the prerogative of God. This for the simple reason that the will can only be moved by its object, which is good. The object of the will is good. And once God presents itself to the will as, as, as its supreme good, the will cannot but follow it and move the other faculties to pursue it. From what we have said thus far, we can see the close relation between the Holy Spirit and grace. Holiness, we've seen, we've seen that holiness says order to God. And again, holy is the proper name of the third person of the Trinity. For this reason, the tradition of the church has always attributed the sanctification of the just to the Holy Spirit, as he is the one who moves our will and makes it capable of being united to the will of God. And we can all recall to mind the words of the apostle when he exhorts us to live a life in the Spirit. So, between the Holy Spirit and the sanctified soul, there is a very, very, very special relation. There is a relation of origin, because it implies the original movement of the will of God towards the soul in grace. And it also implies a relation of communion between God and the soul in grace. This is why our Lord, when speaking to Nicodemus about the new order of grace, speaks of it in terms of a new birth, to be born of the water and the spirit. And later on, in his discourse at the Last Supper, he speaks of the life of communion with the Father, we will come to him and dwell in him. This indwelling of the Holy Trinity in the soul is so profound that it should, properly speaking, be compared to the spousal relation by which the two become one flesh. As Father Gabriel Arintero com comments, speaking about the, new, the union between God and rational creatures by grace, I quote, he, God, wishes to contract with us all the most intimate relation that can be imagined. And again, I quote, he wishes to form one body with us. We see then how we are conjoined to the Holy Spirit by this created likeness that is infused in us and that we call grace. And hereby, the bond which unites the soul of the just to the Holy Spirit is the promise of eternal beatitude from the side of God, and the promise to persevere and to grow in that state of holiness, to persevere in that consecration in the state of being ordered to God on our side. So God, that promise, eternal beatitude, and man that promised to be faithful to that, to that um, predilection, to that love. So we, go, we, we can see the, the, the similarity, as it were, with, uh, with a spousal relationship. This state of union with the Holy Ghost is proper to all those who have been regenerated by the water and the spirit, cleansed and purified from the old yeast. But, as the Apostle tell us, each person receives, receives grace in a different measure, in such a way that some receive more because they are, they are ordered to be united to God in a much more special manner, 
and others receive less. Not to their shame, not, not to their shame, of course, but so that the edification of the body of Christ be completed in the different members. And so, in this order of grace, we must place at the very, very, very top Jesus and Mary, from which fullness we have all received grace upon grace. There is no doubt that the soul of him who was to be united substantially with the divinity, Jesus, should have been made capable of receiving the immense grace of the hypostatical union. And so the, the church fathers and doctors have always believed and proclaimed. But we should equally hold for certain that an analogous plenitude of grace of the closest type has been bestowed upon the soul of Mary, who was chosen from eternity to be the instrumental cause of the union between God and man in the incarnate word. And here we can all recall um, that mediation of which we spoke you know, in the, after the first conference you know, at the Annunciation, how Mary um, becomes a means of attaining to that grace of union for Christ himself. Amongst the theologians over the centuries, there has been much discussion with regards to the relationship between the fullness of grace in the soul of Christ and the fullness of grace in the soul of Mary. And it is noteworthy that the Franciscans, after the profound intuition of our Seraphic Father, who defines Mary as the one in which was and is to be found all fullness of grace and goodness, have always strived to defend Mary's unique state of grace. We know that grace, the grace of the hypostatical union, which Christ had, is far superior to sanctifying grace because it is obviously a greater thing to be God by nature, the union between uh, the second person of the Holy Trinity and the humanity of Christ, than to be children of God by adoption, the union between God and the soul through uh, a created participation of his divinity, through sanctifying grace. So obviously there is a, a huge distinction and difference. You know, it's more perfect the grace that Christ had to be united to the second person of the Trinity than our grace, which is basically our participation as adopted children. And we also know that it is far more noble to be the mother of God by nature, the grace of Mary's divine maternity, than to be the daughter of God by adoption, again, san through sanctifying grace. So there is, um, there is, there is um, a hierarchy of, of perfection here. We have the hypostatical union at the very top, and we got the, the grace of, of the divine mother who following immediately afterwards, and then we got sanctifying grace. This is what confirmed by the angelic doctor who in ordering the hierarchy of grace following the Aristotelian conception of being, places the grace of union of the word and the humanity of Christ at the very top of the ladder and then following immediately after the grace of the divine maternity as a, as a sort of type, a type of grace of union of its own. But what about the Immaculate Conception? What about Mary's fullness of grace? Is it greater than sanctifying grace? As we said above, sanctifying grace makes us adoptive children of God by participating to us a created likeness with the divinity. So in this sense, it is the foundation of all the other graces we can receive, and the mode, the, the fashion after 
which we receive uh, the graces. When we receive graces, whatever we receive, whatever grace we receive, we receive them as children, as adopted children of God. You know, whereas, you know, we could say Mary received graces as the mother of God. But as we've seen, sanctifying grace, as noble as it is, is not the only type of grace capable of enabling us to enjoy the beatific vision. In fact, we know that the regardless of the sanctifying grace, the, the grace of union in Christ was enough to, to cause in, us, in his sacred humanity the beatific vision and the ontological immunity from sin regardless from sanctifying grace, that grace of union was enough for Christ. Equally, the great doctors of the church and more especially the great theologians of the 15th century have been ever zealous to navigate in that vast sea of Mary's fullness of grace in order to grasp as much as possible the consequences of her state of perfection and while we can easily understand the superiority, how superior uh, the divine motherhood is of a sanctifying grace, because as we said, it's far better, as it were, to be the mother of God by nature than to be the adopted children of God by participation. As she told St. Bernadette, she is the Immaculate Conception, meaning that her union with the principle of grace is so rooted in her own act of being that it is impossible for us to find the right terms to describe it. We know that Mary's fullness of grace coincides chronolo chronologically with the first instant of her conception, as the dogmatic bull in a fabulous Deus reminds us. And we also know that this fullness of grace in Mary was far superior to the sanctifying grace which we all receive, because it made Mary not only immune of any sin and concupiscence, but also incapable of contracting any sort of inclination to the slightest sin. To prove this, it would be enough for us to remember that Adam and Eve were both created in grace, sanctifying grace, but nevertheless fell from the high, the high state, whereas for Mary, it was impossible to sin. As St. Bernard says, I quote, a most abundant, sanctifying blessing descended, descended on her, which not only sanctified her birth, but subsequently guarded her, her life untouched by all sin, which, as it, as it is believed, was certainly not given to any other among those who were born of a woman. It was suitable indeed for the queen of virgins through the privilege of a singular sanctity to lead a life without any sin. She who gave birth to, to the redeemer and obtained for us all the gift of life and justice. And like St. Albert the Great synthesizes in his Mariali, where there is a venial sin there is a certain lack of grace. But Mary was full of grace, therefore there was no sin in her. A higher effect supposes a higher cause. So, if sanctifying grace is not enough to produce in anyone the impossibility to sin, whereas Mary's her fullness of grace did produce such impossibility, it is evident that Mary's fullness of grace 
is by far superior to the grace of adoption. Now, it remains for us to understand what is the nature of this fullness of grace in Mary. By the grace of her divine motherhood, Mary participated in the generative, generative virtue of God the Father, and thereby be inserted, as it were, in that substantial relation of origin of which we spoke above, becoming the perfect created image of that eternal generation. So we see at the Annunciation how the Holy Spirit overshadows the Blessed Virgin Mary and as the angel promised, the virtue from on high will, will descend upon you and so it, it will produce the, the, the incarnation. So she participates at the Annunciation, she participates in that virtue or as it were power or that quality of the Father who generates the Son. But where does her fullness of grace put her? Where does the fullness of grace put Mary in terms of relation with God? Perhaps it would help us to go back to that prayer of St. Francis quoted above. Holy Virgin Mary, among the women born into the world, there is no one like you, daughter and servant of the Most High and Supreme King and of the Father in heaven, mother of our Most Holy Lord Jesus Christ, spouse of the Holy Spirit. Holy Virgin Mary, there is none like you. In the first line, we have Mary's unique holiness, her fullness of graces, none like you which is placed at the beginning of the prayer, like the effect, as were, leading us to the knowledge of the cause, just as we have in our natural sciences. We go from the effect to the cause. Then continues, daughter and servant of the Most High and Supreme King and of the Father in heaven. Who is this Most High and Supreme King? The Son, who in virtue of his divine nature is the most high, and in virtue of his human nature becomes our supreme king. Because as the philosopher says, as Aristotle says in his politics, there is, there is kingship or monarchy where there is equality of nature. But in this same line, we have the Father in heaven as a joint principle of Mary's holiness, in such a way that she can be said to be in a relation of procession from both the Father and the Son. And who is it that proceeds from the Father and the Son? The Holy Spirit as a procession of divine will, as a procession of love. Now, Speaking of the Holy Spirit, we said that there are two notions that are closely related to the name Spirit. First, we said we have love, which we said imply the idea of motion towards the object loved. Just like a spirit in our physics has a certain aptitude to be the principle of motion for lighter bodies. Secondly, we said we have the notion of gift, which we said was the nature or aptitude of love to be freely shared to the person loved and to be possessed and used at the person's disposal. There is a certain sense of unlimitedness. But as we said, a divine person, in this case the Holy Spirit, cannot be said to belong to another divine person as a gift because obviously there is only one will in God. And it, it is precisely here where Mary comes as the complementum sanctissime trinitatis, that is the complement of the most holy trinity like Hesychius of Jerusalem calls her because 
to be possessed as a gift, God, the Holy Spirit, requires a rational creature capable of receiving and containing such immense fullness of love. And where is it that two persons exchange with each other the fullness of love, the fullness of gifts? Where is it that two persons are said to belong to each other, to be at the other's complete disposition? Sacred spousal, of course. And so it is that St. Francis adds immediately the title spouse of the Holy Spirit, which, by the, as we saw with Father Serafino, is actually the first time it appears amongst the Latin authors. I mean, obviously, we mentioned uh, St. Prudentius, but, you know, properly speaking, he was, he was a poet, and um, he doesn't have, he's, 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 uh, he's calling Mary um, spouse of the Holy Spirit might be seen as more as an alleg allegorical um, statement. And this spousal with the Holy Spirit takes place in the very, very first instant of Mary's conception, when God the Holy Spirit, the author of grace, consecrated Mary for himself to be one with him. But above all, this divine choice goes back all the way to the eternal councils before creation, as we find it written in the book of Proverbs, which, as you know, the church has always applied to Mary. And it goes, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. Before he made anything from the beginning, I was set up from eternity and of old before the earth was made. The depths were not as yet, and I was already conceived. Neither, neither had the fountains of water as yet sprung out. The mountains with their huge bulk had not as yet been established. Before the hills, I was brought forth. As we said, these words, which which speak of the Holy Spirit, of the wisdom, the church has always accommodated to Our Lady, especially throughout the Marian feast, precisely because she belongs to him from eternity. That is what he says, the Lord possessed me. And as, again, I repeat, uh, a divine person cannot really be said to be um, possessed by another divine person in the full sense of the word, of course. So, if you want to study the mystery of Mary, you must study the Holy Spirit, because this is her origin. This is where she belongs, possessed by the Holy Spirit, and fully enriched with the presence of the Trinity dwelling in her. fully possessing, as it were, the fountain of grace and making us share of this her fullness. Truly, it was better for us that Jesus returned to the Father, as, as he told the apostles, because with the coming of the Holy Spirit, we have come to know Mary, by which we are, will be able to penetrate more in the mystery of God. We will be able to understand creation, we will be able to understand redemption, and above all, we will be able to understand justification. Very dear to St. Francis, and consequently to the Franciscan school, is the Marian Christocentrism, which sees Jesus, Jesus' predestination through Mary and in Mary. As St. Bernardine of Siena says, simile es Maria in predestinazione, that is, Mary is similar to Jesus in her predestination, and obviously the bull, 
in the Pavel Isaiah reminds us that she is predestined with, in the same decree as Christ. And so, for us Franciscans, she was foreseen and predestined regardless of sin for the sole purpose of being the tabernacle of the Most High, the recipient of the gift of gifts. So, I just want to end up with an invitation. Let us then turn to her, asking her to intercede for us so that we too may be filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, with the spirit of intellect and counsel, with the spirit of fortitude, with the spirit of piety, with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And thus, we shall be able to attain the perfect imitation of our Lord and teacher. St. Francis, pray for us. Thank you, Fra Francisco, <clears throat> for this talk. It was quite difficult at times to follow. I think when the distinctions were about the Holy Trinity, the distinction between the three persons and uh, the nature, which is no distinction, and uh, what about the three persons among themselves? Is there any distinction? between the person of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Yes, of course, otherwise we don't have three persons, we have one person. And this is a very old heresy. But it was very good, thank you. Uh, we have understood <coughs> that uh, the Holy Spirit, within the Holy Trinity is the love, and the love is out, is, is put out as grace is, is uh, shared into creation, over creation as, as grace. But of this grace, Our Lady is the fullness. And the fullness of Our Lady is ontologically different from the grace we receive, because her grace is the, the whole grace of Christ, plus the original grace. And, uh, and uh, we have a share in that grace, but just a share, while she has the very fullness of it. There is a beautiful image that might help us see the, the, the importance of Our Lady being full of that grace, that uh, uh, participation to us of God's love, which is like a vessel. She is the vessel containing all God's grace, and that grace is given to us. And St. Francis understood this very well, yes, in uh, his beautiful prayer, mystical prayer, but uh, we have still to, to learn more about and to reflect more.